Hello, welcome to the NGHS CME podcast. I am your host today, Dr. Erin Raybon Rojas. I am a pulmonary intensivist here at Northeast Georgia Health System, and I am so excited to have my uh, guest on with me today. We are here gathered this time um, to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why it matters and how important it is in our healthcare and in our healthcare system. Here at NGHS, we wanna make sure that we are pouring into the community, pouring into our um, employees. And this is just one of the many ways that we have conversations around patient care, wellness, um, and specifically today, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So not only are these ladies very talented in medicine, they are good friends of mine. So I'm Dr. April McDonald. I'm a pulmonary and critical care uh, physician. I also specialize in interventional pulmonology. I've been with NGHS for the last four years now. And um, in my free time, Other when than I have some, <laughs> in, in my infinite amount of free time <laughs> that I really don't have at all, <laughs> Um, I really do enjoy just spending time with my family. I have a four-year-old, so I love spending time with her. Awesome. And Dr. Betsy Grunch. I am Betsy Grunch. I am a board-certified neurosurgeon. I am born and raised here in Gainesville, Georgia, and um, really have only spent the years outside of my life in education uh, outside of Gainesville. <laughs> But I've been uh, back to Gainesville since 2013, so 10 years in practice here, and I love serving our community and seeing the system grow over the years has really been very um, amazing to see what we've brought to the community and to our area. Um, I, since I'm from the area, I love Lake Live. I love uh, surfing on on Lake Lanier, and um, I just enjoy anything community related. I have. Uh, two kids, five and eight years old. And just like Dr. McDonald said, in my free time, I just enjoy spending time with my family. Today, we're going to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This has been such a hot button topic for us here in the healthcare world, um, also in uh, medical education as well. And I wanted to just open this up to say that we're not talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion because it's popular or unpopular or something that's trending right now. We're talking about it because it actually means life and death to patients. And as we go through this podcast, we're going to talk about um, how some of these uh, disparities or challenges and barriers in healthcare can either um, can hurt patients, um, hurt the care that we give, um, but on the flip side, when there is um, more diversity, how it, it can enhance patients, patient care, and the care that we give. So the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to first get Dr. Grunch's thoughts because you being a neurosurgeon, um, in the surgical world, I know that there are significantly, there's a unbalanced scale of um, men and women. So I wanted you to give just a few stats to the audience about your particular discipline and um, the diversity or lack thereof <laughs> within within your within your particular discipline of neurosurgery. In neurosurgery in general, uh, in terms of male versus female, the gender disparity, there's less than 10% women, I mm -hmm. think on, on depending on where you look, but it's around six to 8% female surgeons versus male. And then if we break that up into people of color versus um, others, it's less than 1.8%. Um, if you talk wow. about even break that down further and uh, females, uh, of color, it's it's 0.6 percent. So there really is just a huge disparity, and I think that really kind of weighs into the 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 care that people get, and um, and just kind of you know how they feel uh, with their provider and connecting with people that mm -hmm. um, uh, that take care of them. I think it's a it's a huge uh, elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Dr. McDonald, in interventional pulmonology, first I want you to describe really quickly what interventional pulmonology is, and then give us a couple of your stats as far as your diversity in your field. 
So interventional pulmonology, it's a subset of pulmonology in that it's more of a procedural-based uh, segment of the field. And so really doing a lot of advanced procedures, um, uh, uh, taking care of both malignant and benign diseases in pulmonary. Um, so it starts to almost kind of mirror what, you know, how a surgical kind of spe mm -hmm. specialty would look like. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, with interventional pulmonology, um, I think that we ha similarly have a lot of statistics, or some statistics that, are, that it's more male-dominated. Male um, when you look out at the result, or excuse me, the data, um, it's, really not a, it's really limited. It's mm -hmm. a small field still, maybe about 350 um, board-certified interventional pulmonologists in the U.S., wow. um, but of those, so maybe, you know, the, the limited data that I, a little bit of data I could find about uh, that topic uh, internationally, um, the, the statistics say that there's about half and half actually within the field. Now that's internationally, so it doesn't really necessarily reflect the U.S. data. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, when, when we look at actually people of color and, and women of color within interventional pulmonology, this is where it gets really, you know, the population goes down a lot uh, to the point where, you know, this is unverified data, but from what I can find, I may be the first interventional board certified interventional pulmonologist in the country. Um, so it's crazy because I graduated in 2018 right. from that field mm -hmm. and from a fellowship in that field. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, you know, there's obviously an underrepresentation within mm -hmm. the field. Um, I was very uh, fortunate to uh, be at our conference our, for interventional pulmonology uh, recently, and I saw people who and women in the field who were coming and few, new fellows that are coming through the pipeline. And it was just so rewarding to see that even if I am number one, yeah, there's going to be a two, three. <laughs> there, we're coming, yeah. and you know that just makes all the difference for patients. Seeing, you know, having that connection with people who look like them and who can relate to them, uh, it make and it some, it helps outcomes too. Yeah, it's funny that you talk about um, just the the. It's so shocking that we're this far into you know. This century and we're still talking about the same challenges um you know in fellowship in inner city detroit i was only the second um african-american female that was a fellow in inner city detroit in pulmonary and critical care so it's crazy yeah it <clears throat> is it really really is um so going back to talking about why this is and this being life and death, you know, there's so many examples and so many different studies that show specifically for African-American patients that um, when they are cared for by um, doctors who look like them that are African-American, there is um, they feel more satisfied and a part of their health care, a part of their health care decision making. And they're more likely to go the next year to get preventative care, recommended vaccinations, recommended blood work. Um, which is honestly the cornerstone of our, what we do is try to do preventative care. That being said, there was a very interesting JAMA article that came out. <laughs> um, and we did talk about this on our last podcast, but we didn't get into it as much as I want to right now. Um, this is probably one of the most respective, um, uh, respected journals um, in, in healthcare and in medicine. So what there was was a uh, study in the JAMA surgical um, uh, publication regarding surgical outcomes in female versus male physicians. And really and truly, the outcomes showed that at the 90 day and one year follow up that female surgeons had better um, outcomes. So Dr. McDonald, although you are not a surgeon, but definitely in that procedural world by why what you do and what you specialize in, I wanted to ask you first, what are your thoughts about this? Is this surprising? Is it not surprising? Thoughts? <sighs> it's not surprising, that outcome, but it's, you know, it's disappointing, right? In a lot of ways, because from a patient standpoint, you know, you don't always get to choose who come, who is your doctor. And yet, you know, we're seeing that outcomes are impacted by how 
how um, providers kind of come to the table, mm -hmm. if you will, um, and how they interact with their patients. And so I think that for that reason, it's a disappointing statistic. You know, I can in hypothesize about, you know, just from what patients say in regards to their interactions with me, you know, a lot of, you know, you spend more time with me or this is the most time, amount of time that I've ever had with a physician as far as explaining things and help and making them feel included within the conversations mm -hmm. that we're having and really a part of their care. And it's just, you know, I want that should be the the aim of all physicians, right? It shouldn't matter, you know, if you're you're a woman, if you're a man, if you are white, if you're black, if you're any anything in between any of those, it really should be you know you're trying to provide the best care for your patient because that outcome matters. Definitely, Dr. Grunch, thoughts. I mean, I I don't think I'm necessarily surprised by that. Mm -hmm. I think that I'll share the thoughts that Dr. McDonald said. That I I think that. Patients say, come to us as providers that have seen other physicians and kind of voice their experience. Um, and of course, this is just kind of anecdotal. It's not really evidence-based, but we can all begin to imagine why this number is true. And, and of course, it's not specific to a male or a woman. It's a generalized statement because you'll have great male physicians, you'll have bad female physicians. So I think, you know, you have to take this data for what it's worth, but I think from a patient standpoint and what, what I have heard um, in patients that have seen other uh, providers is, the, is the what, what she said is, you know, they, they feel like we spend a lot of time with them. We, we talk about preventative care and in, in the surgical world, it's, it's a lot about surgical decision making. And, you know, you can look at an MRI scan and, and, and recommend things, but you have to look at the whole patient. You have to talk to the patient. You have to talk about their socioeconomic status. Can they recover from a recommended mm -hmm. surgery? Are they going to do well with it? Do they have the social support that they need to undergo this big surgery? Or should we look at, you know, perhaps a smaller option that may not give them, you know, the full relief of what they need, but it's really what's best for them and, 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 and risk factors, you know, there's so much that goes into surgical decision making that's vast across the field and, and you have to really weigh in and that takes that takes a lot of um, time on the on the teaching standpoint and um, and I think that really weighs in to the best outcomes as, as surgeons that really take all those things into account mm -hmm. and um, so that's my that's my thoughts. Great so I know that there's been a lot of <clears throat> social media um, post about this and you did a post I did a post um, and actually what I was really surprised to see was that there were a lot of our male colleagues that were also making a post about this and highlighting it and that mm -hmm. was really really nice to see because as we're talking about diversity equity and inclusion you know we're not just talking about one issue we're not talking about race or gender it's it's all it's you know ableism ageism, LGBTQ um, issues. It, it's, it's such a wide breadth of, you know, topics that encompass the DEI um, uh, framework in healthcare. And I really do think that it's important for us to talk about all of them and the importance of allyship um, in healthcare. Yeah. 